Hey everybody, what's up? Mad Season here, back with another video for you. So recently I made guides to help you figure out your class and race, and as promised, this is the profession picking guide. The Burning Crusade has big changes to professions, and it's a pretty important choice. In my opinion, even more important than in vanilla. In vanilla, most of the good items were bind on equip, so even if you didn't have the respective profession, you always had that option of just buying it with gold. For example, you don't need to be a blacksmith to equip the Lionheart helmet. This changes quite a bit in the Burning Crusade, however, as most of these items have shifted towards being bind on pickup on craft. So this results in seeing more paladins and warriors with blacksmith, cloth wars with tailoring, and so on. The ultimate goal in this video isn't to outright tell you what to pick, because it's not that simple, and it varies quite wildly with what you want to actually do in the game. Are you a PvE'er, a PvP'er, a gold farmer, erotic roleplayer? Hopefully, by the end of it though, you have a pretty good idea of what you want to pick up. So I first want to really cover what the professions are as a whole, and talk about what they specialize in, what good items they provide in the Burning Crusade specifically, a bit of gold making, and most importantly, what benefits they bring to not only your group or raid, but also their exclusive benefits to you as well. And just a small note before we begin here, training has changed a bit in BC. Before you had apprentice, expert, and artisan trainers, and many times they are spread out all over the place. For instance, to learn 300 alchemy as alliance, you have to go all the way to Feralis. This changed in BC to just one trainer who trains everything up to 300 for the old world, and then you can find the trainers for 375 skill in Honor Hold for alliance, and Thralmar for the horde in the Hellfire Peninsula. So let's get into it here, starting with a new profession, and that's jewel crafting. As you may know, this profession can cut gems to provide stats and create various useful jewelry items, including rings, amulets, trinkets, among other useful items. Gear has a bit of added depth this expansion, with the addition of sockets and gems. The short of it is you put gems of various stats into these sockets to max out your character. You loot the rod gems from mining nodes, which makes mining a very handy profession to pick alongside it, but you can also get them from looting enemies, you can buy them from vendors, or by prospecting ore for a random selection of gems appropriate to that ore. For example, Thorium can give an arcane crystal, a diamond, or other old world gem, and Fell Iron on the other hand gives you all of the early BC gems, Adamantite gives you a higher chance at rare gems, so what jewel crafters do is they learn patterns for many different cut gems throughout the game, and these gems are the ones that actually provide the stats. They're loosely color coded, and for those who paid attention in kindergarten, your knowledge of the color wheel will play a big role here. So for all of you horde players out there, I brought in a visual aid. You have red, blue, and yellow as sort of your base colors. Here's a full list of stats for each and every base color. And the mixed colors, which are orange, purple, and green, are sort of middle ground mixes of the stats provided by red, blue, and yellow. I'm not going to explain the whole color table, but for example orange, which is red and yellow combined, this gives you the benefit of red and yellow gems. This is important because gear that you get will have these colored sockets, either red, yellow, or blue, and a socket bonus. You can put in any gem color into any socket, but you do have to match them to get that bonus, and the combo gems, such as orange, would be valid for both a red and a yellow socket, for example. Whether a socket bonus is worth it really depends on the piece and your class and spec. A lot of the times, it is just better to zerg one color if the bonus isn't all that powerful. And in addition to all of this, you also have the special meta gems. These are extra powerful, unique gems that only fit in your headpiece if it has a meta gem slot. The bonuses range quite a bit, and are generally more impactful than the raw stat gems that we just talked about. Chance to stun, chance to increase attack or spell casting speed, mana regeneration, run speed increased, root resist, and many more. The only catch is that they do each have their own special requirement to work. Some examples are, some require gems of a certain color, some require at least two of each, and so on. So anyone can use these gems. You can make them, and sell them, but as with most professions, you do get some perks that only you benefit from. For jewel crafters, you do have exclusive and more powerful gems. 
As you can see, these are bind on pickups, so only the jewel crafter can use them. And as you'd imagine, these are basically more powerful versions of the normie gems. These were initially added in patch 2.2 of the game, which was the patch after Black Temple, but before Zelamond, so that would land it in phase 3 or 4. My guess is phase 3. Regardless, you get them from the various reputations in the Burning Crusade, as you can see. Do note that they are unique though, so you can only have one of each. And that's one per gear set, not gear piece. If you try to equip an item with a unique gem that you already have in another equipped item, it won't work. In the original game, these didn't require jewel crafting, as you could see, but Blizzard came out and said that they'll be changing it. The reason being is that people used to just stack a bunch of gems, and then drop the profession, and thus still retain its benefit. And I know a lot of people are planning on doing this, and they're going to waste a ton of gold when they realize that it's changed. So, just something that I wanted to warn you about here. You can also make the following trinkets on launch. These are handy, but nothing too groundbreaking really. They're nice to have if you're having trouble finding your normal best in slot trinkets, and they can tide you over until then. I do want to put a special emphasis on the panther though, which increases your stealth level, which makes it a must for PvP rogues and druids in my opinion. And in Sunwell Plateau, which will be phase 5, these received a big upgrade, and they're relatively easy to craft. They do require reputation with the Shattered Sun Offensive, which is a new reputation introduced with the raid, that you grind rep for via the daily quest hub in the Isle of Koldanas. I don't think any of them are best in slot really, but they'll be pretty prolific simply due to their availability. You can also get some ring and amulet recipes from the raid. These are quite powerful. Some even best in slot for PvE depending on your spec, and again, some bind and pick up which means that you need to have the actual profession to make use of it. The money making potential is high, especially if you're one of the first to get a rare pattern of something that isn't bound on crafting. You can also just straight up gamble. Prospecting takes 5 ore, and it gives you a random selection of gems like I said, so some people just buy the raw ore off of the auction house and prospect it to turn a profit. As with all gambling though, the results are of course mixed, and will vary heavily on your server's economy. You also have your brilliant glass cooldown. Once every 20 hours, you can convert uncommon gems into brilliant glass, which contains blue and even purple gems. Because this has a cooldown, it has value, and can serve as a slow but steady way of earning gold. Something nice to learn on an inactive alt. You just need a character level of 50 to learn the BC tier of crafting, and a jewel crafting skill of 350. So gems, trinkets, amulets, rings... Jewel crafting starts off with a bang in the Burning Crusade. It's a profession that gives good exclusive benefits, and grows in power greatly in phase 5. It has good options for gold making, both steady and through brilliant glass, or perhaps you get a rare pattern relatively early, and it also has the hit or miss stuff like that prospecting. A bit of everything really. And next we have enchanting. Enchanters can enhance pieces of gear with extra stats or effects, very similar to its state in vanilla, with new higher level recipes to find and learn as you'd imagine. It's typically paired with tailoring, as you can turn cloth into greens, which you can then disenchant into dust and shards to fund your enchanting recipes. I won't really go into all of them, I mean everyone watching of course knows we're getting new patterns and recipes, but there are some that are particularly powerful that I'll have on screen here, because they're handy to know for gold making, as these will be in high demand. Executioner is a weapon enchant that has a chance to give some armor penetration, Mongoose has a chance to grant some extra agility and attack speed on hit, Sunfire increases fire and arcane spell damage, and a ton more. Way too many to go over one by one, but just jot these down and try to keep them in your head because these ones in particular will be in higher demand. As for gold making, it's just as good as it is in vanilla, very high, especially if you're the enchanter for your guild and you get fed all of these high level recipes early on. There's a bit of a funny story going on with the weapon oils. Enchanters, as you may know, can make healing power or spell power weapon oils, sort of like the blacksmith's sharpening stones, and the new ones in the Burning Crusade are the superior mana and wizard oils. It's 15 mana per 5 for healers, and 42 spell damage for spellcasters, but they're superior in name only because the old ones are actually better. The brilliant mana oil gives just 2 less mana per 5, but also 25 healing, and the brilliant wizard oil gives 6 less spell damage, 
but also 14 crit rating. You get the recipes for these from the Zandalar tribe at the friendly and honored levels. And speaking of vanilla stuff too though, a lot of the old world recipes do still hold up. Namely, a lot of the ones that you get from Ankiraj. So much so that Blizzard even promoted them to the various reputation vendors in the Burning Crusade. So it's just a nice quality of life change here for any enchanters who maybe missed out on Classic. You don't have to form up a raid to go farm these out. Just grind the rep. There are also some minor details worth covering. First is, you can no longer disenchant everything at enchanting level 1. In BC, the higher quality the item, the higher skill you need to disenchant it, so that got a nerf in BC. And, as for their personal benefit, they do have special ring enchants that only enchanters can apply to their own rings. Here's a full list. Note that this, along with jewel crafting as mentioned earlier, is getting changed so that you do need to keep the profession to retain these enchants. So it's an important profession just based off its own merits. A lot of people look at it as being the quote best for min maxing due to their unique ring enchants. Next we have alchemy, which got some really important changes in TBC. This profession specializes in consumables, elixirs, potions, flasks, mana potions, healing potions, tinctures that'll save you in a pinch. They aren't bound to you, so it's not required to have alchemy to use them, but they do still retain some profession exclusive benefits as you'll see. It's commonly paired with herbalism, as most of your potions are made from herbs. A very important change is that it's harder to stack consumes in BC. If you're familiar with vanilla rating, you know just how powerful consumables are. Get your mongoose, your giants, fire water, flask, poison resistance, absorb potions. In BC though, this was toned down as many consumables are now split up into what are called battle elixirs and guardian elixirs, and you can only have one effect from each at a time. Battle typically are offensive based consumes, like increased attack power or spell damage, and Guardian, as you'd guess, are defensives like increased health, resistances, mana per 5, and so on. And Flasks, due to how powerful they are, count as both a Guardian and a Battle Elixir. So it's a very important change here that I thought worth mentioning because it has a bigger effect than you'd think on BC rating compared to Vanilla. A bit less punishing if you do die because you don't have to go through so many consumables. What about the actual consumes though? Well, much like the enchanting section, I won't go over every single new consumable, but I will cover the more important ones for the sake of gold making. Here are your flasks. Yes, the flask of supreme power is still used, as it holds up quite well in TBC. Don't just default to flasks, by the way. For many specs, it's actually better to use a guardian and a battle elixir. Flasks are more appealing if you're learning fights though, because they don't disappear on death, which will save you some gold in the long run. And potions are your shorter 20 second-ish buffs. It's a 2 minute cooldown, so possible to get 2 of these off depending on the fight. And you also have your standard healing and mana potions. The BC ones are called super healing and mana. Many of these you learn through the new discovery mechanic. By making a BC consumable, you have a chance to randomly learn the recipe for the following. Even including flasks. And speaking of flask making, you'll be happy to know that you now have an alchemy lab in Shatrath City right here on the map, so no more Skolomance or Blackwing Lair Clears. Alchemists can also make cauldrons of magic protection for each element that people can click on for potions, much like a soul well. It holds 25 total, one for each member of a full raid, and to learn the recipe for them, you need a discovery proc for making the protection potion of the respective cauldron. For example, you want the cauldron of fire protection, let's say. You need to make major fire protection potions until you learn it. As for their exclusive benefits, alchemists can make some trinkets that increase the effectiveness of healing and mana potions. These are typically seen as being more useful for healers for that extra buff 2 mana potions, and it's a good idea to keep it in your bags in case you do run into a mana intensive fight. And alchemists also have unique specializations. Sort of like Armorsmith or Weaponsmith for blacksmithing, if you're familiar with that. Once you reach 325 skill level and a 68 character level, you can complete quests to specialize in three different areas. Potions, Elixirs, and Transmutes. You can only choose one, and when learned, you have the chance to proc more of whatever you specialized in, up to a total of five in one single craft. If you change your mind later on, you can pay a 150 gold fee to switch it. But regardless, overall, the potential for gold making with alchemy is extremely high in BC. 
Speaking of transmutes, alchemists do retain the ability to transmute items into other items. Primal Might is a reagent used by many different crafting recipes, and you can also create those meta gems I mentioned in the jewel crafting section from uncommon gems in the primal elements. These have a 20 hour cooldown, and it's shared across all transmutes, so if you transmute a Primal Might, it puts every other transmute on a cooldown as well. For gold making, you can bank on those extra procs, and you can load up on level 50 alts solely for the transmutes, which serves as almost passive gold making, because they have a cooldown, they have value, and you'll net a straight profit by either converting the items yourselves, or selling just the cooldown to someone using their materials. Just log in, click a button once every 20 hours, and if you really want to push it, you can get your alts to 68 so you can become a transmute master. That obviously requires quite a time investment though. But as strong as it is, they don't have as big exclusive benefits that you'd see with the other professions. The main thing are those trinkets for increased effectiveness for healing and mana potions. Overall, pretty strong choice though. And next we have blacksmithing. No huge change in functionality here. Blacksmiths can make a wide variety of mail and plate armor, weapons, spurs, shield spikes, various other useful items that are aimed more towards classes like warrior or paladin, but definitely still good for others. It's most often paired with mining, as the recipes all require bars and stone to craft. Blacksmiths, just like in vanilla, can specialize into armor smithing or weapon smithing, which gives them access to special exclusive patterns, many of which the items crafted are bind on pickup, and even requiring the specialization to equip. Weaponsmith splits off into three sub-specializations, that's Swordsmith, Hammersmith, and Axesmith. Each spec holds three tiers of unique one-handed and two-handed weapons that become progressively better and better. Here's the progression for all of them. You'll notice that tiers 2 and 3 require the previous tier weapon to craft, along with some extra materials. Primal Nethers, as mentioned, you get from Heroic Dungeons, and Nether Vortex, on the other hand, you get from the Serpent Shrine Cavern and the Tempest Keep Raids. Special note here, the one-handers will be main hand at first. This was changed in patch 2.4 to be one-handed, and a lot of people are expecting that on release, but Blizzard came out and said that they will be main hand until a later phase. This is important because that of course means that you can't do wield them until the change is out. The best ones depend not only on your class, but also your preferred activity and playstyle. For example, by now you may have heard about Storm Herald. This is the tier 3 two-handed mace, crafted and usable by hammersmiths only. It has a stun proc, and combined with the warrior's mace stun talent, it makes them extremely deadly for PvP. The one-handed mace, Dragon Ma, is the pre-raid best in slot for fairy warriors. On the other hand though, Swordsmith might be the way to go for the Lionheart Executioner, which allows you to take advantage of the warrior's sword spec. This is great for PvE arms warriors or red pallies, although it is still good in PvP too if you're paired with a shaman with Wind Fury. Storm Herald will be way more common in PvP though, rest assured. So what you specialize in will largely depend on your class, spec, and activity, and make sure you do plenty of research before picking because it is a huge investment. To learn these specializations, you have to complete the Weaponsmith quest, which requires the following vanilla era weapons, then you're sent to Winter Spring, where you just talk to an NPC and learn them. No quest required for BC, and you can pay gold to change your mind later. As for Armorsmith, much like Weaponsmith, you have to reach character level 40 and Blacksmithing 200, and the quest is offered by the following NPCs. To learn how to make the items, you have to follow a very long quest chain. Or alternatively, you can just buy them off the auction house or from another player who's done the quest chain already. Armorsmiths also have their own tier 3 progression with the following chess pieces for both mail and plate. They're alright, but they definitely aren't as coveted as those three tier weapons that you get from weaponsmithing. I also wanted to cover the new sharpening stones. These don't see much use in BC because, well, both factions have shamans now, and weapon stones actually block out wind fury. Rogues use poisons on their offhand. Shaman's Wind Fury, which leaves just Fury Warriors, so it's very niche now, but you do get the Adamantite Sharpening and Weight Stones, which give an extra 12 weapon damage and 14 crit rating. The money making potential is very dependent on what patterns you have. If you're one of the first to get a pattern for a nice BOE, that can earn you some gold. But just like in vanilla, the gold making potential of Blacksmith will vary wildly on what recipes you get. 
It wouldn't be my first choice for gold making, that's all I'll say. Tailoring got some big updates. As you'd guess, this is a profession more catered towards cloth wearers, so quite a few warlocks, mages, and priests will pick up this profession. As mentioned, you typically pair this with enchanting, since you can turn the cloth items you make into enchanting materials. There are three types of ur cloth in BC, and that's primal moon cloth, shadow cloth, and spell cloth. Any tailor can make all of this cloth, but you can only specialize in one of them. When you do so, you get two of that cloth per craft instead of one, and you unlock some unique recipes tied to that specialization. Just talking gear here first, Shadow Weave Specialists unlock the Frozen Shadow Weave set, which is used by Warlocks, Frost Mages, and Shadow Priests. And Spell Weave, on the other hand, allows you to make and equip the Spellfire set, which is good for mages. Note that people often confuse this with the Spell Strike set, which is different. Spell Strike is by non-equip, and doesn't even require tailoring to use, although you do need tailoring to benefit from the set bonus. And Mooncloth Tailoring allows you to make and equip the Primal Mooncloth set, which is good for healers of any kind, not just priests. These do require the specialization to even equip, so you can cheese it by making it and then switching later on. Unlocking these specs can be done through soloable quests from the NPCs that you see right here on the screen. To start these, you do need a character level of 60 and a tailoring level of 350. To get the actual cloth, you'll learn a pattern to convert the following items into them. Sort of like Mooncloth from Vanilla, if you're familiar with that. Like I said, you can learn all three types, regardless of your spec, and they have a 3 day and 20 hour cooldown. And unlike the Alchemist Transmutes, these cooldowns are independent of each other, but you also have to be in special areas for each one. For Primal Mooncloth, you need to craft it at a Moonwell. For Shadow Weave, you have to craft it at this altar in the Shadow Moon Valley Zone. And for Spellweave, you just have to be in Netherstorm. When you make it, it'll summon a mob that drops some motes of mana as a bonus. This isn't all of their new stuff though. We also have the Spell Thread Enchants. These are new leg enchants for casters, usable by anyone, but craftable by tailors, and it'll be one of your money makers in the expansion. And the Netherweave Net is definitely worth mentioning. This is a 25 yard range, 3 second route, at a 1 minute cooldown, which is enormously helpful in PvE or PvP. They're not usable in Arena though, as you'd probably guessed. You can also make 20 slot bags via Primal Mooncloth. Note that this doesn't require specializing in Mooncloth to learn. Any tailor can learn it and make it. It isn't the biggest bag in the game. That goes to the Giganti bag, which is sold by Harris Pilton and Shatrath. But that's rather expensive, so there will still be a demand for these, and it'll be one of your money makers. I also wanted to point out that there's a new 28 slot soul shard bag for warlocks, which is made with shadow cloth, and similar to the primal moon cloth bag, you don't need to specialize in shadow cloth to learn it. And aside from that, you have a bunch of non-specialized patterns, of course. For Taylor, there are a ton that are pre-rate best in slot, or even best in slot period. Way too many to list, but here are some of the more popular ones that I know of. So overall, it's a great choice for any cloth wearer, or those who just have inactive alts and you want to turn them into profession mules and take advantage of those profession cooldowns. Leatherworking is next on our list. This profession focuses on making leather and male armor, so it's more appealing for rogues, druids, hunters, and shamans. It's most often paired with skinning, as their recipes require an abundance of leather. Although there aren't as many as, say, Taylor, you do have some pretty good bind on pickup crafted gear that you'll see in a few best in slot lists here and there. They retain their three specializations from vanilla, that's dragon scale, elemental, and tribal, and are learned from the following NPCs for Horde and Alliance. For the Burning Crusade, Elemental gives the Primal Strike set, which is agility leather, so more appealing to rogues and wannabe rogues, or I mean feral druids. Tribal gives the Windhawk set, which is spell damage and healing leather, and Dragon Scale gets the Ebon Nether Scale and Nether Strike sets, which are physical DPS and spellcaster mail sets, so hunters and shamans here. Similar to the tailor, you need to actually be specialized appropriately to even equip them. Leather workers also have the ability to make leg armor enchants for tanking and physical DPS. These aren't bound in any way, so you don't need to be the actual profession to use them. 
Instead, their exclusive item comes from the use of drums. Well, sort of. Only they can use it, but your party members benefit from it. And as of this video, it's at the center of some controversy. So, in the Burning Crusade, leather workers can make items called drums, and on use, they provide buffs to you and your party members. The effect lasts for 30 seconds, they have a 2 minute cooldown, and they're only usable by leather workers. After seeing how world buffs played out, and just how much the min-max and parsing culture can affect the game, the community is up in arms over this, fearing that they'll be mandated to learning the leatherworking profession solely for these drums. As of this video, the concern hasn't seen a meaningful solution. Right now, the plan is when Zolaman hits, you can get greater drums, which increase the radius, but the leatherworking restriction remains. This could change in the future, but as of right now, it's believed that leather workers will have a lot of influence in the scene in the game. So overall, it's an important profession for building your character, but how does it hold up in the gold making department? Well, pretty decent. Those leg armors will be your bread and butter, and certain BOE patterns may be worth exploring. The fell leather set I know is pretty good, and there are various other BOE patterns that'll either improve your character or your pocketbook. I also wanted to give a special note to the riding crop though. This is your mount speed increase trinket, and this is the mount speed increase trinket your girlfriend told you not to worry about. It's 10%, bound on equip, and most assuredly will be in high demand as it's a must for herbing, mining, and PvP. So in summary, if you are in a min-max guild or that's your playstyle, and you're a slave to DPS rankings in the recreation of a 15 year old video game, it's a very appealing profession. It's not my first choice for gold making personally, but it's not terrible. Definitely better than what it was in vanilla in my opinion. Engineers can make various gadgets, trinkets, and explosives to aid them in their adventures. Like blacksmith, this is paired with mining, as your recipes will require bars and stone, and it's a profession that's useful for every class really. Hunters get a bit of added benefit, as there exists some gun recipes, scopes, and you can even make your own ammo. You will find that a lot of your gadgets from vanilla are made to be ineffective against targets over level 60. You do get access to new stuff to replace them of course, but a very important thing to note is that it's much more micromanaged than in vanilla. Beforehand, like I said, it's the Wild West where you can use anything everywhere, with a very few exceptions, and as a result, Engineer was almost a requirement, especially for PvP. Most good groups wouldn't even let in non-engineers because it simply wins games. This has shifted in the Burning Crusade though because Arena, the main PvP activity for the game, 90% of it is disabled. There was a point where rocket boots worked, as evidenced by this old PvP video, but this was removed in patch 2.4, and since TBC Classic is mostly based off of 2.4.3, these should also be disabled. They retain their two specializations, Gnome and Goblin, each having their own unique recipes that I'll cover later. You can learn these specs from character level 30 and skill level of 200 and onwards, then you complete a quest requiring vanilla era patterns from engineering. Grenades are back in a big way. You have your normal adamantite grenades, which are the same as ever, a ranged 5 yard AoE with a disorient attached to it, it's just more damage than the previous thorium grenades. And you also have the frost grenade, which functions as a ranged frost nova of sorts. And I have no idea why I'm telling you this, because I hate mages, but this does work with your shatter combo. You know, just in case you didn't think like 10 roots would cut it, here's number 11. Just don't use it on me, okay? I told you about it, so I should get immunity. Do note that all of the old grenades fall under the same nerfs as the previously listed gadgets. You can make the following goggles, which are very powerful. These were confirmed for the tier 5 phase, which is phase 2, so you'll have to wait a bit for these. This confuses me though because these were originally released in patch 2.1, which was Black Temples, so shouldn't that mean phase 3? Unless I'm missing something there. Oh well. Don't confuse them with the gnome goggles, which we'll talk about later. And similar to the jewel crafting trinkets, they all received an upgrade in the Sunwell Plateau patch, so don't underestimate these, they're really important. And just in PvP, they're great for that stealth detection. A lot of rogues will be picking it up for sure. You may have noticed this curious affix that it allows you to see these gas clouds on the minimap. 
Throughout Outland, there are these floating clouds that engineers can suck up for some elemental motes. To do this, you need to make the moat extractor and use it near a cloud. So it's a neat little way to earn some extra gold. You'll run into them here and there on your mining route and get some bonus materials. These are the new rocket boots in BC. If you thought the vanilla boots were fast, you haven't seen anything yet. Again though, disabled in Arena in patch 2.4. Engineers can also make their own flying mounts in the Burning Crusade, both 60% and 300% speed. So a bit of extra swag there to set yourself apart from everyone riding griffins and stuff. As for the goblin-only items, this rocket launcher trinket is one of their more popular gadgets. After a long cast time, you shoot a rocket launcher at your target, dealing pretty heavy damage, stunning them, and knocking you down. The trinket is loaded with stamina though, and they're seen as being really good tanking trinkets right out the gate, especially since you can equip two of them, making the profession even more appealing to tanks. The Super Sapper Charge is a sequel to the Goblin Sapper Charge, dealing a whopping 1200 fire damage to all enemies surrounding you and 900 to yourself. Just like the Goblin Sapper Charge, you need Goblin Engineer to make it, but you don't need it to use it. So it's still really good. Just like in vanilla, having the whole raid pop sappers is incredibly powerful when used at the correct time, and good for AoE threat. The only downside is they're quite expensive to make because they do require a primal mana. Gnomes aren't left in the dust completely though. They do get the Nigh Invulnerability Belt, which absorbs 4000 damage. Unlike most other stuff, this is usable in Arena, and a lot of people claim that it'll be almost required for high level ranking early on in the game, as players are still building up their resilience. The backfire will most likely get you killed though, as it causes you to take double damage for a short amount of time. And you may have also noticed that while it does require Gnome Engineer to make, it doesn't require Gnome Engineer to use, and it's also bought and equipped, so it's something you can just buy if you go Goblin. They also get the Poultryizer, which is a 15 second polymorph, which can also come in handy. But just like all these other gadgets, they can backfire. The main issue is that it isn't usable in Arena, while the Goblin Rocket Launcher is, so it's whatever. As mentioned previously, they also get some exclusive goggles. They're not the most powerful really, but they're something that a lot of people forget about, and it can fill out your gear set a bit. Ideally, you want the previously listed goggles eventually though. Overall, if you ask me, I think goblins are better. Something to note is that gnomes do still keep that Tenaris teleport, which is important as a Caverns of Time holds BC dungeons and a raid. In 2.4, there was a teleport to the Caverns of Time added in Shatrath as well though, which will eventually limit the gnome's usefulness, depending on what phase they decide to add it. You do get two new ones for BC as well, and that's Blade's Edge for gnome and Netherstorm for goblins. It's not really as big of a deal in BC since the world is so small and you already have flying, but they're there if you want them. I did also want to make mention that some of the old world stuff did escape the nerf bed and are still used in TBC. Repair bots are just as essential, allowing raid or party members to repair right inside the instance. You can use the old repair bot if you wish, but they did add a new one that'll be a bit cheaper to make. Jumper cables do still hold up. These are handy for dungeons if you have a druid healer and no res or something. You can simply buy the goblin jumper cables and still use them. You don't need to be a goblin engineer. And also, they're not even trinkets anymore. They're just items you now use, which is pretty handy. Overall, Engineer is still incredibly useful in BC if you ask me. There definitely will be fewer with the profession compared to vanilla, but that's only because all of the other professions are so good now. As for its gold making potential, the mode farming I mentioned earlier will be quite lucrative. Almost all of these gadgets require Engineer to use, so from my experience those are really hit or miss for gold making. Most people tend to just make it themselves if they're an Engineer. You can make the scope for hunters though, as it's usable by anyone. And this gun is very good for tanking as well, so you do have some options. In my opinion, it is way better in the gold making department compared to its vanilla counterpart. And that's it for all of the crafting professions. We do also have the gathering ones, like mining, skinning, and herbing. Really though, there's not a whole lot to say there. We have new herbs to gather ore to mine, and leather to skin. And it's pretty straightforward. I do still want to go over the basics for any beginners watching though. So miners go throughout the world, picking away at veins for ore, which you can then prospect into gems as described earlier. 
or smelt into bars to fund engineer and blacksmith. Herbalists do the same with herb nodes, which gives materials for alchemy, and skinners harvest various leathers to fund leather working. They're good professions to get if you don't want to bother with all of this crafting stuff and you simply want to farm something to sell on the auction house. Unfortunately, you can only track one resource at a time in BC though, so taking both herbing and mining is possible, but it can be annoying to constantly cycle between the tracking. Aside from that though, the best I can give you here are the herbing, mining, and skinning requirements for everything in Outland. For mining, you can find fell iron in any zone, most commonly Hellfire, and Adamantite you find everywhere but Hellfire. From these veins, you get the Eternium Ore as sort of a wild card, and the veins themselves are also sometimes Corium veins, which is a high level material. Something I suggest before going into the Outland is to pick up a Glove Enchant with plus 5 Herbalism, Skinning, or Mining, as I can't tell you how many times I've run up to a vein, only to find out I'm like one point away from being able to mine it. The last thing you need is to fall behind, and then you enter a new zone with nodes or mobs or herds that are too high to level to gather. You really want to keep up with that as you're leveling, so you don't need to backtrack later on. Something I did want to mention with herbalism is that the Lotus for BC is a little different. In vanilla, to make flasks, you need the Black Lotus, which was its own separate herb. It's rather rare, it has its own spawn points, it's camped by multi-boxers, and farmed by bots, so sometimes pretty frustrating for the average person to farm. The BC Lotus, however, is the Fell Lotus, which just has a chance to drop from the new herb nodes in Outland, so it's something that you should actually see much more often. Herbalists also do get a few buffs that I wanted to mention. These are shared with your Hellstone cooldown, so they're not completely free, but from Zanger Marsh or the Coilfang Dungeons, you can pick Flame Cap, which gives you a fire damage proc and fire spell damage for a minute, and from Felweed, you can sometimes get a Fell Blossom, which absorbs some damage. And Blood Elves Only can get Blood Thistle from the Eversong Woods, which gives spell damage when you're high, and negative intellect when you've come down. They're handy, and also not bind on pickup, and the only one that actually requires herbalism to use is the Fell Blossom. And lastly, we have the secondary professions. These are professions that everyone should get, as there are no restrictions on them, and everyone can get all three. Fishing allows you to fish fish, big surprise there. Cooking allows you to cook this fish and other meat into food, which gives you stat buffs. And first aid allows you to create bandages to heal yourself or allies, and they of course get some love in BC. As for first aid, you just have more powerful bandages to make. Fishing and cooking go hand in hand, just as they did in vanilla. There are some food buffs that are considered the best that you can only make with fish, so they're important. You can always buy them, but making them yourself always saves you some extra money. An interesting thing with cooking is that you can make some pet food that buffs hunter pets quite a bit, so doubly important for any hunters out there. And for the fellow Chad Fisherman out there, world first 300 fishermen in the recreation of a 15 year old video game by the way, this is our moment to shine because how could I not mention the fact that you get to summon a raid boss? The lurker below is a boss that you fish up in the Serpent Shrine Cavern raid, and if your guild are a bunch of casual non-fishing scum, you do only need level 1 fishing for it. Another update though is that it was BC is when they added the Weather Beaten Journal, which gives you the ability to track fish on your minimap. You can get it from fishing in debris pools, or from the new fishing dailies. From Old Man Barlow, who's located just outside Shatrath, right here in Terracar Forest, you can get quests to turn in rare fish for a bag of treasures, which contains very high vendor price items, fishing equipment, that journal, among other miscellaneous useful items. And on top of that, the addition of this high vendor price fish. In general, fishing is way more lucrative in BC compared to vanilla, and it's one of the things I'm worried about with this level 58 boost because it's also very easily boughtable. But I digress. That's about it, really. There's an overall coverage of every profession, what benefits they bring to both you and your teammates. The goal was for you to enter this video with no idea what you want, and now maybe you've narrowed it down to a few choices and have an idea of gold making potential of these professions, their min max capabilities, and just what fits best for you and your gameplay. If you're still undecided on your main class or even the race for that class, I do have full guides for that that you might find handy if you enjoyed the format of this one. I'll have those linked in the description. But, anyways, thanks for watching. I hope you found it handy. Like the video if you liked it, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.
Farewell for now, mortals. We hope you enjoyed today's video. See you again soon.